Good morning. So we're, um, we're in John's Gospel, as you may re- recall. We've been, we're working our way through it. And this morning, we're looking at the first section or first part of the first section of John chapter 7. When uh, I was first looking at this, I realised that somebody had given the title to this section, Authority and Right Judgment. I don't know who made that suggestion because I couldn't quite make sense of it and then I remembered it was me. Uh, But I must admit, I I was quite unsure about how to approach these verses in John 7. There are just so many different aspects and elements in this, in this section that you could talk about. I was quite tempted to uh, title it as knowing stuff because there's a whole lot of references to knowing things or not knowing things. There's knowing the right time and there's knowing how Jesus knew so much and there's knowing if Jesus spoke the truth and there's knowing where he came from and knowing where he was going there was a whole lot of knowing or not knowing going on in these in these verses however I'm not going to talk about that I I kind of feel I want to talk just about the first section the first 18 or so verses of John chapter 7 and the overall theme that comes through in this section is the issue of integrity so let me read these verses to you So after this, and what John's referring to there is um, Jesus had been giving some really tricky teaching which had kind of slightly disturbed some of his followers and some of them had stopped following him because of it. It was too hard. So after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He didn't want to go about in Judea because the Judeans, that's the kind of Jewish leaders, they were after his blood. And the time came for the Jewish festival of tabernacles. That's... um, a bit like our harvest festival where they were celebrating how God cared for them in the wilderness. So the time came for the Jewish festival of tabernacles. So Jesus' brothers approached him. Leave this place, they said, and go to Judea. Then your disciples will see the works that you're doing. Nobody who wants to be well known does things in secret. If you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. Even his brothers, you see, didn't believe in him. My time isn't here yet, replied Jesus, but your time is always here. The world can't hate you, but it hates me because I'm giving evidence against it, showing that its works are evil. Tell you what, you go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast. My time is not yet complete. And with these words, he stayed behind in Galilee. But when Jesus' brothers had gone up to the festival, Then he himself went up, not openly, but so to speak in secret. The Judeans were looking for him at the feast. Where is he? They were saying. And there was considerable dispute among them about uh, about him among the crowds. He's a good man, some were saying. No, he isn't, others would reply. He's deceiving the people. But nobody dared speak about him openly for fear of the Judeans. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Judeans were astonished. Where did this fellow get all his learning from, they said. He's never been trained. My teaching isn't my own, replied Jesus. It comes from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do what God wants, they will know whether this teaching is from God or whether I'm just speaking on my own account. Anyone who speaks on his own behalf is trying to establish his own reputation. But if what he's interested in is the reputation of the one who sent him, then he's true and there is no injustice in him. Jesus then talks a little bit, uh, picking up uh, some episodes from two chapters previously where he'd healed somebody on the Sabbath and caused a bit of a stir doing so. And then verse 24 he says, Don't judge by appearances, judge with proper and right judgment. So I want to talk this morning about integrity. And I want to talk about it in several different um, areas of our lives, in several different sort of sections, just very briefly. Firstly, integrity in our motivations. 
integrity in our motives. You see, Jesus' brothers had suggested in the passage we read, nobody wants to become well, who wants to become well known does these things in secret, these things being like the miracles and the healings he was doing. If you're doing these things, show them off to the world. So the question, do we want to be well known? Do we want to be noticed? Do we want to be admired? To gain a larger following? Perhaps on Facebook. To make a name for ourselves? Or as it uh, says a little bit further down in the passage we read, to enhance our reputation. Is that what we want? To attract larger crowds? It's certainly tempting. You know, Jesus' brothers were not entirely wrong. They had a point. Surely it would be good for Jesus' ministry, for his mission to, to get out there and let everybody see him. Um, Galilee was a kind of rural area where he'd been, been doing a lot of these miracles. And Jerusalem was where, uh, and in Judea around there, was where it was all happening. It was the sort of centre of power where lots of people would be gathering, particularly at this feast. That was surely the time to promote himself, to get noticed. But Jesus wasn't concerned to enhance his own reputation. For Jesus... He simply wanted to do what God wanted and to wait for God's time. See, it comes down to the fundamental question, who are we trying to please? Whose opinion really matters to us? Are we trying to please the crowds? Or, in this case, pressure from our families? Or our friends? Or are we simply focused on pleasing our Heavenly Father? Are we ambitious for our profile or God's profile? I was listening last night to a very, very old worship song. It shows how very, very old I am. There once was a man called Graham Kendrick. You won't remember him song that always struck me that he wrote in your way and in your time that's how it's going to be in my life and that's how Jesus lived before his father in your way and in your time that's how it's going to be and that's the challenge for us if we're going to live with integrity in our motivations what is our motive? Is it for God or is it somehow for our own profile? It's a matter of integrity in our motivation. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to sift our motives. Lord Jesus, our Master, sift our motives. And then... I want to look at integrity in a different way. Integrity in our witness. Jesus says um, in the next verse down, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I'm giving evidence against it, showing or exposing how its works are evil. For most of us, we like to be liked. We like to be approved of, to be accepted, to be popular within our community, to say what people like to hear in the way they like to hear it. Not to stand out or be too different. But for Jesus, he was prepared to stand out. And by what he said and his very presence and his whole lifestyle, he was challenging the prevailing culture of his time, particularly the religious culture just by who he was and what he said and going around doing the things he did, he was an immense challenge to that prevailing culture. He was distinct, he was different. He exposed the blatant hypocrisy of many of those around him and he was hated for it. He spoke truly. The world just didn't hate his brothers but they did hate him because he was exposing them. 
it's a reminder of what we've read back um, in John chapter 3, if you may remember, where we read, light came into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because what they were doing was evil. People around us, even in our culture, don't necessarily like having things exposed. Having people tell them or reveal to them or expose the fact that things are not right. And if we're going to walk with Jesus, we're going to have to face the prospect that we're not always going to be liked. We will be distinct. See, Jesus was very clear. We read in Luke 6, Woe betide you when everyone speaks well of you. That's what the ancestors did with the false prophets. The modern version of that is, Where have I erred that all men speak well of me? If we don't cause some offence, there's a question mark over the integrity of our lives. I don't mean unnecessary offence. We don't need to stand... We, We need to stand out for the right reasons, not just because we're the awkward squad or speaking a language that people don't understand. But we will be distinct. Paul makes the same point in uh, in Romans. He says, don't let yourselves be squeezed into the shape dictated by the present age. You see, we are citizens of a different country and we are subjects of a different king. We will be different. And sometimes that will stand in rather stark contrast to the situation around and to the culture around us. And we have to be prepared for that. There was a famous quote I came across uh, not long ago from somebody um, called Dean Inger. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. Simply says this, whoever marries the spirit of this age will find themselves a widower in the next just think about that a minute whoever marries the spirit of this age will find themselves a widower in the next we will be distinct because we are citizens of a different country and sometimes that doesn't go down well in our society in our community so it's a matter of integrity in our witness before others and we do need to to allow the Holy Spirit to challenge us Am I distinct? And then I want to just touch on integrity with our words. Jesus said, My teaching isn't my own, it comes from the one who sent me. My teaching isn't my own. Those of us who stand up here on stage and and teach need to pause at this point and take three deep breaths. Are we simply using our natural gifts to try to be clever or impressive or amusing or persuasive? Whose words, whose teaching are we giving? Peter says in 1 Peter 4, talking about the different gifts that we have, whoever speaks, let it be with God's words. Ouch. Whoever speaks, let it be with God's words. And Paul states very clearly in 1 Corinthians, he says, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom when I came to you. I was in weakness and timid and trembling and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. Whose words are we giving, are we sharing are we expressing? But it's not just those of us who sometimes speak in public. Speaking just very personally, I've become increasingly aware over the last few months of the need to be a bit less quick, a bit less hasty in how I respond to people. So I get lots of, quite a lot of emails and messages and texts and WhatsApps and whatever. And it's very easy for me, and I'm prone to it, to quickly shoot off a reply to just oh yeah I can just answer that one immediately and squirt off a reply to whatever the question was or the issue that was raised is fire off this reply now there are two problems with that 
The first problem you all know about, it's called autocorrect. This was a good friend of mine discovered last week. I sent a message just um, reminding them that I thoroughly enjoyed reading C.S. Lewis's uh, book or rereading it for about the third or fourth time, The Last Battle, brilliant Narnia series. Unfortunately, when I went back and looked what I'd said, I'd referred to it as The Lady Battle. <laughs> I, I don't know how that happened. That's a problem with being a bit hasty with our replies, but it's much more serious than that. See, I'm sensing personally that I need more often, much more often to pause, to wait a bit. It may only be, you know, five minutes, or it may be an hour, or maybe come back to it the next day, but I need to pause after drafting something, after writing something, after text, drafting a text, and to simply check that I have the permission of the Holy Spirit to send it and to phrase it like I have. I just need to be very careful because my words need to be what God's saying. I need to check the Holy Spirit's permission for what I'm squirting off in emails and messages sometimes. And that takes a bit of time and James says in his letter we all need to be really quick to listen and slow to speak. And I'm having to learn to listen carefully if I want to recognise the promptings and indeed the checks of the Holy Spirit. And it also avoids the occasional embarrassing typos. But it also, this integrity with our words also applies um, very directly in terms of our honesty and our truthfulness. Especially, perhaps, in the little things, because it's it's in the little things that we can we can bend the truth a little bit. We can just be a little bit not quite truthful. It's just so easy in our conversations to phrase things in a way that kind of subtly puts the focus upon us, puts ourselves in a good light, or when we're talking in conversation or even at the front to take credit for some thought or idea that we actually borrowed from somebody else but it looks good or sounds good. Or we just bend the truth a little when it's convenient to us. I was talking to a good friend just this last week who shared how the the Holy Spirit had really strongly convicted them of having just said just a little untruth, just a trivial little lie. And it I, mean, I don't even know what it was, but I think it was a small thing, a trivial thing. It, it might not have mattered, except it does matter if we're going to walk in the Spirit. If we're going to walk in integrity in our words, we need to be careful and we need to be open to the Holy Spirit's conviction of us where we've been less than entirely honest and truthful. And then I want to talk for just a moment about integrity in our discerning and our judging things, our assessing things. Jesus says uh, in that verse we read at the end of that passage, don't judge by appearances, judge with proper and right judgment. He's actually referring back to that incident I mentioned, that healing on, healing somebody on the Sabbath day, which got him in trouble. And there he says in, in um, John chapter 5, my judgment is true or trustworthy, reliable, because I'm not trying to carry out my own wishes, but the wishes of the one who sent me. You see, so often my discernment, I suspect it's true for many of us, my assessment of things over issues and questions, it's distorted because I have my own personal agendas. We need integrity in our discerning because we carry our own personal agendas, our own desires and preferences. We have, as the saying goes, got skin in the game. Jesus could say that his judgment on matters 
could be trusted because he was never seeking to do his own will. He never, it wasn't his own desires that were dominating. He only ever wanted to do what God, his father, was wanting to say. But my desires get in the way a lot. And we may not always be able to honestly say like Jesus that we're never trying to carry out our own wishes, but we can invite the Holy Spirit to help us become more self-aware, to help us become more aware of our own biases, our own prejudices, our own opinions that are perhaps colouring or distorting our judgment on matters. We can ask the Spirit to help us become more self-aware of our hidden desires, our hopes or our hang-ups that may be influencing our responses. As we progressively learn to walk by the Spirit, over time we can grow such that we're able to say like the Apostle Paul, but we have the mind of Christ. One very practical way that I've found helpful in that, um, which helps me grow in self-awareness, so that hopefully my discernment on things is less distorted by my personal preferences, is to consciously take time at the end of the day to review things with Jesus. At the end of the day, just to take maybe a few minutes, just to spend time in the presence of Jesus and review my day, what I've done, what I've said, what I've thought and why I've thought it, to talk over my day in the ways I've responded and to invite his comment. I find that a helpful way to grow in self-awareness. I believe it has actually a name. It's a practice, uh, the 24-7 prayer people uh, refer to it as the examine. And it's a good name. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to examine us. But I find it helpful to do it pretty much on a daily basis towards the end of the day, just before I go to bed, Help me to become more self-aware, Jesus. It's a matter of integrity in our discernment and we need to invite the Spirit to point out where we're falling short. And then finally, I just want to talk about integrity in our understanding. Integrity in our knowing stuff. Jesus says in verse 17 of this passage, if anyone wants to do what God wants, they will know whether this teaching is from God. In the other Gospels, <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jesus has, uses a phrase which I personally think has a similar meaning. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And the point he's making is this, if we're genuinely ready to respond to God, we will grasp what he's meaning. But the reverse is also true. If we're simply wanting to accumulate knowledge for its own sake, without any commitment to actually obey, then we will struggle to comprehend what Jesus is saying, or worse still, we'll completely misunderstand it. You see, seeking knowledge for its own sake, without a commitment to relational obedience, is actually dangerous. Seeking knowledge without having resolved that we're going to obey is dangerous. That was the problem right back, right back at the beginning in the garden. Humanity wanted knowledge without relational obedience. That didn't end well. Could I have the band come up please? Um, I had the pleasure uh, a few weeks ago of, of meeting a lady uh, called Tanya Harris um, and just for your information she's going to be visiting here in the autumn um, we're going to open it up to other churches in the area <clears throat> and uh, I strongly recommend it she's from Australia um, and she leads a, a ministry called God Conversations which is basically to help people uh, hear Jesus for themselves and she tells a story, and probably will tell it to us when she's here, about how it all began for her. You see, she'd grown up believing in Jesus, but she was frustrated 
that some of her friends, people she spoke with, seemed to have a relationship with Jesus where they actually sensed him communicating with them personally. And she didn't. And she found that very frustrating. That wasn't her experience. So one day, I think in some exasperation and frustration about this, she prayed something along these lines. Jesus, if you will just speak to me personally and clearly, then I promise I'll do what you say. Oops. Dangerous prayer. Dangerous prayer. He did, and it turned her life completely upside down. Ultimately, for the better. But that's a serious prayer. But you see, we need to have that attitude. If we want to understand things, we need to have committed that we're going to do what Jesus says. You know, I, I know I long for more revelation, to understand more, to have more insight, for Jesus to speak to me more clearly and to share with me more deeply. But he's not interested in just filling my head with more knowledge. As Paul said, knowledge has a tendency to just puff up. Jesus wants to deepen our relationship. And that requires my commitment to respond in obedience to whatever it is he reveals step by step. Jesus will share more deeply with those who are pursuing a deeper relationship with him. The Spirit of Jesus often speaks in a whisper. To hear him, we have to get closer. So maybe I was right at the beginning. Maybe this whole passage is all about knowing stuff. It sort of is. But it's a matter of integrity in our knowing. It requires that we resolve to obey the promptings that he gives us. And the more we learn to do that, the more he will reveal and the more we will understand. And when we stop actually doing what he says then we'll stop understanding what he means. Thanks, Joe. If you'd like to just quietly pray. I'd like us to respond corporately this morning rather than doing anything in a uh, sort of inviting individuals to go. So if you are able and feel comfortable, would you like to stand up? And you may want to close your eyes. You may want to hold your hands out as we seek to respond to what the Holy Spirit may be saying to us about integrity. As I've said, growing in integrity will often begin, has to begin with the little things. So let's take a moment in silence and consciously invite the Spirit of Jesus to review the integrity of my life, of our lives. The integrity of our motivations are we being driven by personal ambitions or by the loving purposes and the wise timing of our father and the integrity of our witness are we preoccupied with the approval of people around us or do we simply want the commendation of the king whose subjects we are and we invite the Holy Spirit to review with us the integrity of our words have we become casual with our words or even casual with our honesty How is the Holy Spirit prompting us right now that we need to change? And Lord Jesus, we open to you the integrity of our our judgment and our discerning of things. How can we make more room for your Spirit to help us grow in our self-awareness?
and finally the integrity of our knowing and our understanding stuff. Have I resolved, have we resolved before Jesus to respond in relational obedience to what he shows us? Holy Spirit, would you prod us, poke us, prompt us where we need to acknowledge before you a deficit in our integrity and our motives, our witness, our words, our judgment and our knowing and understanding. And will you show us the next steps that we can take to grow in integrity? We invite you to prod us and to keep us on, on task so that we become more like Jesus. And just a word of my own experience, if you do want to respond to Jesus, to something he's saying to you, that one of the best ways to retain that and rather than lose it when you go and grab coffee in a minute is to resolve to go and tell somebody about it. If you're married, maybe your spouse or maybe a really good trusted friend or maybe a small group or even somebody here. If the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something, tell somebody about it. It'll help you to remember and be held accountable for following through with that.